so wonderful to be back. It's so good to see all of you, faces that I, I do know and have known for a long time, faces that I don't know, that I would love to get to know. And uh, it is, it can't believe, I can't believe it's already been a couple of years uh, since just being back here. And as I was thinking about uh, this lesson this morning, and thinking about the Faith Enrichment Day, and really thinking about the gospel fleet as it's all being kind of brought together, I couldn't help but think that as you think of those battleships and you think about the, the warships on the water, trying to navigate through the, the tough seas, uh, finally reaching their destination, trying to ensure victory on the waters, realize that's exactly what we are trying to do as Christians. We're trying to navigate through the trials and the, the rough waters of life, and we're trying to gain the victory, which if you read the, the Scripture, which uh, I assume and can confidently say we do, that we have the victory. Faith is the victory. Why? Because our Lord, our Master, has overcome the world that we have that same victory in Him. And you and I are citizens of this wonderful kingdom that He has established and built. The, the, the church that He has built, you and I are a part of. And we are citizens of that heavenly kingdom. And this morning, we want to guide our focus and attention on some aspects of citizenship um, and, and what that means to us, why it's so important, uh, and how that can help shape our mindset and our focus. Dale Carnegie, uh, an American writer and lecturer, said, the biggest lesson I have learned is the stupendous importance of what we think. If I knew what you think, I would know what you are. Because our thoughts make us what you are, or what we are. And by changing our thoughts, we can change our minds. We can change our focus. We can change our lives. Now imagine what God sees when he looks at us. Imagine what God sees when he sees his people reading his word, following his commands, and sharpening their mind, sharpening their uh, tools, if you will, that God has, that he has given to them, he has given to us to make them more like him each and every day. What does God see? He sees citizens of a heavenly kingdom growing and, and doing what they can to fulfill John 13 35. And though you are my disciples, your love by your love, one another. There are going to be three C's. We're going to alliterate this morning. Uh, I like alliteration. And so really there are five C's. Christian citizenship, but then our three points. It is a covenant. It is strengthened by camaraderie. And it is of the highest caliber. The first one this morning is going to be, it is a covenant. So citizenship that you and I have in, in Christ, in this kingdom, it's a covenant. It is a covenantal relationship that you and I have with our God. When does that covenant begin? Well, Galatians 3.27 tells us a little something about that. Let's look at Galatians 3.27 for just a moment. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul writes these words. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When you look at the context of this, this passage, this is about the context of confirmation of inheritance. This, this is confirming an inheritance that you and I have while being in Christ. But see, as you think about Galatians 3.27, you can't help but skip over, or not skip over, but you can't skip over Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Because the Great Commission teaches us about our life in Christ and what our goal is and what our mission is in Christ. You see, Jesus' mission in Luke chapter 19, or 19, verse 10, was to seek and save that which is lost. But He tells His disciples, He tells His people in the Great Commission, He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It is a covenant. You see, that great commission, when we are uh, added by God to the church, we are making this covenantal relationship with God, saying, God, I'm going to fulfill the things you want me to fulfill. 
that I'm going to be the person that you want me to be, and I'm going to live the way that you want me to live. And see, one of those things, one of the aspects of that covenantal relationship is the Great Commission. Go as you go. What are we to do, Christians? What are we to do, brethren? As you go, make disciples of all the nations. As you go, make disciples of all the nations. And don't stop there. He says, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But you see, don't stop there. Known as uh, people will say, dip them and then drop them. Don't stop there. Don't dip and drop. What's the next thing? Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. You see, there's making disciples. You see, there's baptizing them and there's teaching them. You realize why sometimes... People don't understand the importance of being a Christian. It's maybe sometimes they don't realize that there is an order to this. Jesus makes an order of this, making disciples, making someone who wants to follow our master. Because if someone wants to follow our master, what are they going to do? They're going to be led to baptism. They're going to desire to be made right with God. And if they're going to desire to be made right with God, they're going to desire a life with Him. And that life with Him is going to consist of teaching them to observe all things. That's the covenantal relationship that you and I enter when we put Christ on in baptism. It's a covenant, brethren. Consider that that's something that others need to be taught before they are immersed. It's something we need to know before we are immersed. Because if we don't know why we follow Christ, how can we teach someone else to follow Jesus? If we don't know why that we are following our Lord and our Master, and it's all because we're supposed to, but we can't answer the why. How can we expect someone else to do that either? We can't. It's a covenantal relationship. So what is involved with this covenant? I want to turn our attention to very, uh, well, we'll stay here for just a minute. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. There's so much we can talk about when it comes to our citizenship in heaven. And, and I, I want to be general because our time is, is limited. But in Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to notice two words. We're going to notice the word predestination. We're going to notice the word adoption. I know sometimes that word predestination can be a little bit scary, right? Because the, the world takes that as predestination and says, oh, well, you're predestined before time to, to either be right with God or not be right with God. And God has already determined this for you. And if he does this, you are solid and good to go forever. You see, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches something different. The Bible teaches us in, in Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So where is every spiritual blessing? Well, it's in the heavenly places. But you see, how are you and I going to be able to access that? By being in Christ. Okay? Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, we should be without blame before Him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. Okay, we'll stop there for just a second. In verse 5, that word, the Greek word for predestination, means to decide beforehand. To decide beforehand. Well, you see, in the verse before, in verse 4, there's a word chose. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. That word chose means to decide from one alternative. So... Notice that God chose us from whatever alternative He would have had in mind. And also notice in verse 4, it's a group. He chose us. Well, who's He writing to? He's writing to the church. He chose the church. He chose the saints. He chose the beloved. He chose the group that He set aside. Those who are members of the church. Whoever shall be. Whoever shall be. Whoever will uh, believe in God and obey God, that's who He chose. He chose those who would choose Him. That's biblical predestination. God chose all those who would choose Him. I'm going to build my church. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And everyone who chooses me, I'm going to choose them. Because they chose me. They want me to be their God. Now you can cross-reference 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. Walking in the light as He is in the light. But you see, that's not the only word we want to focus on. Look at verse 5 again. Having predestined us. But predestined us to what? The verse says, adoption 
as sons. Adoption as sons. What did God predestine those who would, be, who would choose Him and be added to the church? He would, cho- he would predestine them to be adopted by Him. They would no longer be an outsider. You see, adoption means to be legally and officially His. In the Roman world, in order for you to be uh, um, under, to have a, a really, if, in order for you to be adopted, you had to have a legal and official separation from your, uh, from your uh, father at that time, and you had to be officially someone else's. What happens when we put Christ on in baptism? We are legally and officially God's. And all the blessings that come with it, all the blessings that are found in the heavenly places, in Christ, verse 3, are ours. Because God made that to be the case. And once you are His, you are entitled to all the blessings which go along with it. God's Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 in a context of being sons and heirs and being no, not a servant in the house, but a son. He says these words, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now sometimes it's really easy for you and I to look at these verses and say, okay, well, we're sons now, so we have all these blessings and privileges. But yet... These aren't blessings and privileges to just be reactionary. We're going to talk more about this in just a moment. But it is to be proactive. These are blessings that you and I need to act upon, that we need to live by. You see, we have the blessing of God's Word. For everything that we need to know in this life, everything that we need to know that pertains to life and godliness, we have it right here in this book. There is no commentator better than God. There is no YouTube video tutorial to help you understand Scripture better than reading Scripture. There's no TikTok, there's no Instagram, there's no Twitter, there's nothing else that can help you understand the Word better than the Word. And you and I have that. But sometimes in this, especially in this age, this age of technology and this growing technology, so many people rely on something else to tell them what the Word is. Even preaching, brethren, preaching can be looked at in that same way. Sometimes if a preacher gets up to preach a lesson, sometimes it's a lot easier to go, man, that preacher did something right. He preached truth. Well, what did he say? I don't really remember. I don't really know. See, that's why I like alliteration. It's a lot easier. But if you don't know what the message is, how do you know it's a good message? That's not being... Brethren, what what citizenship is there in Christ if we don't know what the standard is to uphold? If we don't know what the law is, the regulations are, we don't know what the consequences of our actions could be because we don't study it. We allow someone to preach it to us instead and preach it to us alone. But what makes this covenant superior? A couple of brief things. It's better in its power to save. If you look at Romans chapter 1, Paul writes his thesis statement for really the entirety of the book. And the entirety of the book is going to rest upon this immutable fact that in verses 16 and 17, Paul's going to say, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to what? Salvation. Salvation. Salvation for everyone who believes. There's the all-encompassing nature. God chooses all those who choose Him. For the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You see, God has creation power. He has providential power. He's all-powerful. But yet... For all the power God has, He chose to put His saving power where? In the Word. He didn't put it in His power to create. He didn't put it in His miraculous ability. He put it in His Word. That's where where the saving power comes from. 
And that's where as citizens, you and I are to focus our mind and focus our attention. You see, as we go through this day and we're looking at the gospel fleet for this lesson, for all the lessons that come after, our goal is to change the way that we are thinking or to refocus our mind. That's the goal. And so as we're thinking about the the fleet and the ships on the water, and sometimes it could even be uh, rough water, we want to focus our mind and attention on the Word of God because it's the Word of God alone that's going to save, and it's the Word of God that's going to continue to guide us and strengthen us to continue down this heavenly road of citizenship. But what makes this covenant superior was said in its power to save, but also it's better in morality. Consider how internally and externally consistent God's Word is. No contradictions anywhere found in Scripture. There may be textual variants, things, oh, I forgot a comma here. This, uh, this one has a comma. This one doesn't have a comma. Textual variants don't change the message. But yet, it's not just internally and externally consistent. There's no other book, there's no other writing, there's no other commentary on the face of the planet that has ever been or ever will be as equal to or superior than God's Word. It's better in morality. We live in plenty of of days and times and years gone by where morality has just continued to go by the wayside. When we ask, the, we ask the question plenty of times, how can there be a design without a designer? How can you have rules without a standard? How can you know where right and wrong begin and end? How do you know these things? How do we know these things? It's because of God's standard. It's because of God's word. It's because of God that we know these things. I saw a statistic here. I'd like to share it with you. According to a survey, uh, 2022, a survey of 2,000 people on YouGov, an average of 37% of those people said morality comes from each person's conscience. And they were asked other questions as well, but one of those was, when you look at people generally, and you look at your close friends and family, do you think or would you say that they act selfishly or selflessly? 50% of people said, well, the people generally, if I look at other people outside, they act selfishly. And they go, well, Well, what about your close friends and family? Well, 47% say, oh, well, my family acts selflessly. You see, there's kind of a problem there. Because how do you have 57% of people saying, well, everyone else acts selfishly, but 47% say, my family acts selflessly. Well, that's wrong because somebody else is saying, your family acts selfishly. That's internally inconsistent and externally inconsistent. Those numbers don't make any sense if there is an agreement on where morality comes from. You see, if morality comes from each person's conscience, then we get to make our own standard. We get to go out and do whatever we want, and we can say that it's perfectly okay. You watch any debate on morality, and the person whose standard inside is, well, it's each person's conscience, they'll say one of a few things. They may say, well, we kind of got to, there's some smart people that got together, and they kind of made these standards and rules. Or, Absolutely. Each person gets to determine their own standard. And someone can say, well, what about the Nuremberg trials? What happened when uh, uh, the Nazis were on trial for what they had done? Are they wrong? You realize there are some people that say, no, they were perfectly fine in doing what they were doing. There are people who say, oh, yeah, they're perfectly fine. It's each person's conscience. And no one had a right to condemn them. There are people who have said that. They had no right to condemn them. Friends, our citizenship in God's kingdom is a covenant we make with Him to live and lead a good spiritual life. When you talk about spirituality, it is not just a feeling. We don't close our eyes, put our hands on Scripture, maybe read a nice-looking verse and something that gives us all the feel-goods inside and say, ooh, that's spirituality. That's not spirituality. What is spirituality? It is living a life devoted to God, but watch this, on His terms. That's spirituality. And yes, emotions and feelings certainly come with that, because when we're living the way that God wants us to live, there's blessedness, there's happiness, there's joy that can't be taken away by circumstance. Look at Paul in prison. I've learned Philippians chapter 4. I've learned to be a base. I've learned how to abound. Before he says that, I've learned to be content in all things. But you're in prison. You've been beaten. Yep. 
I've learned to be content in all things. That's what Paul says. Singing hymns while they're in a jail cell. Praising God that they got to suffer. A small taste of suffering for the Master's sake. They were citizens of the heavenly kingdom. When we do, when we, when we focus on living a spiritual, a biblical spiritual life, we focus our lifestyle on morality, holiness, which means to be set apart for God's purpose, and security we have in Jesus. That's the hope we have of eternal life. Okay? It is a covenant. But you see, it's a covenant, but it's also strengthened with camaraderie. And just like a nation, a country really is only as strong as its people. If the, if the nation, the people, turn to chaos, what's the country going to do? Turn to chaos. When you have a lack of morality and you have a lack of God, a lack of order, what happens? You're just looking straight down until you hit rock bottom. That's all there is to it, brethren. But see, the church is strengthened with camaraderie. Being citizens of this heavenly kingdom, our strength is found in God through His Word, but it's manifested through our unity, through bearing one another's burdens, and love for one another. Let's look back at Ephesians, but let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. A lot of people call this the oneness chapter. Paul says, starting in verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Looking at unity, see, it begins with Paul commanding. This isn't a suggestion, brethren. It's not Paul saying, if you feel like it, all the congregations represented can in some sort of aspects of, of the Christian life. It's a command. Walk worthy. He's saying, do it. Do it. Walk worthy of the, of the calling with which you were called. And what were they, to what end were those Christians supposed to do? What was the means to the end, or the ends to the means? It was unity, verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. How was that accomplished? This is kind of where it gets mixed up. No, I don't believe the church would argue at all that, oh, well, our goal is to keep the unity. But yet sometimes we may not know how to necessarily answer it. We'll go, oh, well, through Scripture, that's true. But, but Paul gives us details. He gives us specific. He says, with all lowliness, that's humility. That's humility. What does Philippians 2 teach us about humility, especially Christ's humility? He counted someone else. In reality, all of us. Better than himself. He left heaven because he had you and I on his mind and his heart. He died on the cross and shed his blood, went through agony and pain and torture because he had us on his mind and he had us on his heart. That's lowliness. That's humility. With all lowliness, with gentleness, with all gentleness and with long suffering patience, and bearing with one another in love. That bearing with one another, that actually means this, putting up with one another. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. But notice how Paul qualifies it. He doesn't just say, hey, put up with one another. He says, do it in love. Do it in love. There are times, we're, yeah, we're going to have to be patient with one another. And all these things I look at, and I was doing this lesson, I wrote down, <laughs> I need to work on all of these. All caps. This is a struggle, brethren. This isn't just as simple and easy as preaching and, ooh, okay, it's good to go. These are things we work on, and we work on together. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. When the church loses this kind of behavior towards one another, it can make things tense between the family of God. It can, make, or it can hurt relationships. It can even go as far as someone leaving the church, because of unresolved issues. The Bible teaches us on how to resolve issues. The Bible teaches us on how to resolve this conflict. That's not strengthening one another in camaraderie, brethren. That's allowing pride to come between us and our brethren. And there's no room for pride and the gospel put together. 
If we want to achieve unity with our brethren uh, and with the church, it starts with being unified with God. Look with me at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And really, this whole section of 16 through 26, but really through 24 as well, is about walking in the Spirit. And if you look at some of these verbs, I say in verse 16, say, or walk, uh, in verse 17, the word lusts, all of those are present tense verbs, meaning that Paul is using specific words and specific verbs and specific ways to illustrate the fact that the fruits of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit will always be in contradiction to one another. There will never be a time in which the fruits of the Spirit and the fruits of the flesh can coexist together. Never. Consider those uh, coexist bumper stickers. Oh, can't we all just get along? The T is the cross. Right? It's nice, and it's a good saying. It's a good slow. Can't we all just get along? It'd be great to have unity like that. But the fact of the matter is, we cannot all get along. Why? Because the standard is different. There's a lot of time that we may be arguing for the church, but yet we're not arguing for the standard by which we have to live. So many people live their life now asking questions, why? Oh, well, you need to be baptized. Why? Well, I need to live my life right with God. Why? It's really easy to quote John 3.16, Galatians 3.27. It's really easy to quote them and tell them, but so many people don't know the why behind it. We need to start answering the why. And sometimes as members of the church, we don't necessarily know how to answer those questions. That's okay. Because we have God's word to study and we have one another. Iron sharpens iron. But let's start sharpening. Let's start sharpening. Let's start getting in and digging into the text, bringing out what God wants us to bring out. And we're not going to say, yes, let's coexist. We're going to say, let's look and find the truth. Let's find the truth together. But notice that this is also in context in Galatians chapter 5. It's a context of command. Again, in verse 16, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Paul is saying, this, he's saying and commanding that these two things, the, these walking in the flesh and walking, try to walk in the Spirit, don't let that contradiction be in you. Don't let that be there. In other words, don't believe that you can come and show up to worship services, sing songs, you know, you can give, you can take of the Lord's Supper, you can take notes in your Bible, but if you leave through the doors and you drop all the things that you have, and you go back to the way that you were before you came through those doors, Paul's saying that's a contradiction. Don't have that within you. And sometimes we don't like to ask for help. You see, sometimes it's a fight once we walk out those doors. We haven't talked to anybody. We haven't seen anything else. All we've done is walk through the door, and it's a struggle. See, that's why we have one another. You are not a citizen of the heavenly kingdom alone. You have brethren. You have people to help you. But see, that's why we offer the invitation. That's not offering it yet. Time's not up. But that's why we offer invitation. The invitation isn't just, well, if you've, had, if you've sinned in some way, come on up and confess your sin and let's pray for you. It's a way of saying, if you're struggling, you feel like you're, you're, not, you're not moving any further. You feel like you're paddling and you're paddling and you're staying in the same direction. Or you haven't, you're saying focus on the same direction and you haven't moved anywhere. And you need help. That's what it's there for also. And one way to overcome this problem of, of growing in unity is to get out of our comfort zone and start trusting one another again. Uh, one of the, the former director of the school, one of my instructors, Brother Steve Lloyd, said he was preaching in Chino, California for 27 years and he asked this question in Bible class. He said, why is it that we don't confide in one another as much as we should? The lady raised her hand and she goes, it's because we don't trust each other. You see, she was saying that we're afraid that today's news is going to be tomorrow's gossip. And that today's news is going to affect how we view our brethren because they're struggling. 
And we don't want someone to know we're struggling because that automatically means we're bad Christians. And that we're going to be disfellowshipped and we're going to be kind of kicked out and exiled out there in the cold. Brethren, we need to start trusting one another. How many of our conversations are small talk? Hey, how you doing? I'm good. How about you? Oh, I'm good. Okay, I'll see you tonight at service or I'll see you next Wednesday. Man, I had a, I had a great fellowship at church this morning. It was, it was so nice. Small talk, brother, it's not going to get us there. It's not going to get us there. Why is it not going to get us there? Because maybe sometimes we have a selected group of people we talk to. Oh, we have deep conversations with those select group of people. Then others, we kind of just we'll pass by them, we'll give them the whole little kind of wave and kind of half smile and open palm wave a little bit. But we don't grow in knowing them. Consider Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 uh, through 3. 1 through 5, excuse me. Brethren, if a man has overtaken any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one, a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, bearing one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each shall bear his own load. Well, yes, it is true, you and I have to bear our own crosses, so to speak. You and I have to bear the things that we do every single day. We can't pass that baton off to somebody else. But the things that you and I can't carry on our own, what does God say in verse 2? Bear one another's burdens. And do what? Fulfill the law of Christ. Now let's ask this practical question. How can you bear the burdens of another brother or sister in Christ if you don't know what they're struggling with? How do we bear that burden? If someone is crying out for help, but maybe they just they don't want to go up after at the invitation, or they don't know who to reach out to, if they haven't built relationships, brethren, how do we know that they're hurting? We don't. And what does that lead to? That's Satan chipping away. That's Satan chipping away. Maybe he's chipping at the paint, and pretty soon he's got enough to where he just takes a sledgehammer, cracks his fingers, and just hits a home run right through the wall. We need to, brethren, we need to trust one another enough to be able to have deeper mess conversations with one another, get to know one another. That's not going to happen if all we do is have small talk, brethren. That's not citizens of the heavenly kingdom. That's not our citizenship. You know why we need to have a strong camaraderie with one another? Because we're the only ones that can help one another get to heaven. You can't have denominationalism help you get there. Having a nice neighbor doesn't help us get to heaven, brethren. Our citizenship is strengthened by camaraderie, our camaraderie. And sometimes we need to get back to the basics. Start introducing ourselves to people we've never met before. <laughs> or going to people who we really haven't had the time to sit down at, at, uh, at lunch with in the annex or, or really get to talk to on Sunday morning services or Wednesday nights and ask them how they're doing. Get to know them. Learn what they like, what they dislike. And have them do that for us too. And by doing so, we fulfill John 13, 35. They will know you, they will know you are my disciples if you love one another. That's strengthened with camaraderie. Okay, so we've noticed that it is a covenant. We've noticed that it is strengthened by camaraderie. And now we're going to note that it's of the highest caliber. It's of the highest caliber, our Christian citizenship. Being a citizen of the heavenly kingdom, it's not just this walk in the park where you get to stroll and kind of look at the views, maybe kind of look over the water. Ah, oh, the air is wonderful. The weather is nice. It's not 100 degrees. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. See, that's, that's not what the Christian life is every single day. There's a reason God says that it is a fight. There's a reason why we have Ephesians 6, the armor of God. If it is a walk in the park, why do we need armor? It's not to protect us from mosquitoes. It is to fight the heavenly fight, the good fight. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. I don't know if you have these, uh, these headings in your Bible or not, but in Ephesians chapter 6, right before verse 10, 
Uh, my heading says the whole armor of God. Maybe yours says that too, or just the armor of God. I really like that because it says the whole armor. It really sets up for the entirety of the context. We need the whole armor, don't we? It does us no good to have a sword but no armor. It doesn't do us any good to have the armor without the sword, right? Let's read together, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Before we go further, I want to say, I want to make this point. Sunday may be the easiest day for the Christian. Sunday's the easiest day for the Christian. We get to come together. We get to be with one another. We get to sit in a, in a building where we have fellowship with like-minded people. It's the easiest day, brethren. But we need to bring, according to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, we need to bring our armor every day. We need to wear it every day. If it sits in the closet, it's going to get rusty. Right? Verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. In other words, it's not a physical fight. It's not a physical fight. This isn't the Crusades. This is not a time where you and I fight for the church and the expansion of it, of her. It's a time, verse 13, where we take up, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. That's the idea that you have your shield, you have the armor, you have firmly planted your feet and you are ready and you have your shield and you are ready for whatever comes next. I used to play football as a kid. Our offensive line coach, he would always tell us, you lean forward when you're in that three-point stance. You're down, you're in the three-point stance, you lean forward if you're doing a run play. Well, why don't you lean back if you're running the ball? Because you need to be able to lean forward and go forward. If you lean back and you stand straight up, guess what that defensive line is going to do? He's going to get underneath your pads, he's going to push you back, and the whole play is going to be for nothing. But what happens when the Christian may put on their armor and they don't lean forward? They don't lean in to those raging seas. They get swept away because they didn't do all to withstand. They put on the armor. Isn't that enough? Nope. He doesn't end it, put on the whole armor of God. He says, do it so you'll be able to stand. And he says, verse 14 again, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of uh, peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Brethren, sometimes we stop at verse 17. But verse 18 tells us one of the most important pieces of this armor, and it isn't something that we put on to wear. It's prayer. It's prayer. Who is able, more than able, to take care of us? God. Who is able to provide a way, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, of escape for those things that could overtake us? God. So we need to be praying to Him. We need to be talking to God, beseeching Him, praising Him, being thankful to Him. One of my instructors used to say this. He said, pray like it all depends on God and work like it all depends on you. You see, prayer is not something that's reactionary. It's proactive. He would also, also say, put feet on them prayers. You're praying for help? Well, sometimes the door is there. You just got to walk to it. God doesn't always bring the door to you. You got to walk to the door. And he makes a way for it to be open. Pray like it all depends on God. And he said, work like it all depends on you. That's a mindset. That's a mindset. 
if we pray and trust in God, but yet we are willing to put in the work, brethren, that's of the highest caliber that God's looking for. That's how someone looks at the church and says, you know what, I want to be a part of that. This isn't just the, the, the Bible that people have been preaching and denominations have been teaching. This is what the gospel is. This is what love is. If someone can't walk in those doors and see that, that doesn't reflect on them. That reflects on the church as a whole. That's on us. Judgment begins with the house of God. God or God has a standard, and that standard requires, requires dedication and loyalty. We noted that Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says to walk worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And we noted that in Galatians 3.27, it's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. And then we looked at Galatians chapter 5, 16 and following, and how you can note that in the fruits of the Spirit and the fruits of the flesh, they are total opposite. With that same context, Galatians 5, or Galatians 3 and Galatians 5, the same context of the book. Who is us? Galatians 3.27, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Who is the us according to the fruits? The fruit of the Spirit or the fruit of the flesh? Well, we were the fruits of the flesh. That's how we lived. But the fruit of the Spirit is who? That's Christ who lives in us. This is, a, this is the fruit of the Spirit that we are given. This is how we live. Two different kinds of people. It's of the highest caliber. And we also said earlier that our lesson in our lesson that spirituality was a, a life uh, devoted to God, living a life devoted to God on His terms. So with all those things in mind, let's turn to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4 together. In Colossians chapter 4, you're just getting done with the character of the new man in, in chapter 3. You're getting done seeing how the new man is supposed to, to walk. In verses 12 through 17, it really is about the, uh, the chemistry of the Christian, the makeup. Really, the, the spiritual genetic makeup of a Christian. Right? Uh, H2O is what? That's right, dirt. Um, it's water, right? But it's the makeup of water. Well, what makes up the Christian? Well, Colossians chapter 3. 3, verses 12 through 17, right? As the elect of God, holy, it's holiness, putting on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, there it is again, forgiving one another, putting on love, verse 14, which is the bond of perfection, letting the peace of God rule in your hearts, and being thankful, into verse 15. And I argue that passage, this passage is a wisdom passage because of the very next verse, verse 16. Because let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. What is wisdom? My instructor said this, and it's, it's the only, the, the best definition that I've found. And so take it as, as it will, as you will, and, and test it. Just like all of this, test the word. Test what I'm saying to make sure it's biblical too. Wisdom is looking at life from God's perspective. Wisdom is looking at life from God's perspective. If we don't look at life from God's perspective, we cannot allow the word of Christ to dwell in us. Matter of fact, it won't dwell in us. If you show me a Christian who doesn't study their Bible, who only comes on Sundays and Wednesdays, and most of the time doesn't care about doing their uh, own study other than hearing the word of God, I will show you an individual who is not wise. Because the individual doesn't allow the word of Christ to dwell in them richly. But you look at Colossians chapter 4, verse 5. And this is what he tells us as far as how, how we are walking, how we can be of the highest caliber. He says, walk in wisdom. Walk in a way that, that, that looks at life from God's perspective. Walk in that way toward those who are outside, those who are not members of the church, who aren't added. Redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. That's how we gain people to Christ. Walking and living in a way that looks at life from God's perspective. Because if we look at it from our perspective, it will always be skewed. We don't want to walk in provoking people to, to try to get them converted. Some say that they don't want to hear Christ. Well, let's never, let it never be because we are not walking in wisdom. If someone rejects Jesus, don't let it be because that we are walking in wisdom, or we're not walking in wisdom. 
Don't drive someone away from Christ. But in verses 18 through uh, chapter 4, verse 1 of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 18 through 4, 1, we can see from the context that we, what are you talking about when you say walk in wisdom? Well, masters do it by not being abusive. Servants do it by, by submitting to those who are over them. Fathers do it by not provoking their children. Children do it by honoring their parents. Husbands doing it by loving their wives. And, and wives do it by submitting to their husbands. That's how you walk in wisdom. He, that's the character of the new man. But think of it this way. When you go to the store to find groceries, let's just say you're going to go, you're going to find some fruits. Nice oranges, apples. By the way, it was great to be back in California where the first thing we saw when we walked in the Safeway was good produce. Okay? We loved it. But when you walk in, I don't know how many actually do this, but I've never seen anyone do this. You walk over to the produce and you grab a bag and you just start putting them in the bag. You don't look at them, you don't check them. Oh, this one's bruised, this one's a little bit too squishy. Oh, that banana, I mean, that's really green. That's greener than these pews. No, no, no one does that. They inspect it. Why do they inspect it? Because you don't want bad fruit. <laughs> what does God do with his people? What does he do with you and me? He inspects us. He'll test us. He'll test us. But brethren, what do those outside do? It's like high school. You have the lower class look at the upper class, and they kind of watch what they do to see if it's okay. Oh, well, they ditched. I'm going to go ahead and ditch. I'm not proud of it. I did it too, right? But you see, that's what the world out there does for us. And if they don't see citizens of the kingdom walking in the way that citizens of the kingdom should, they aren't going to want to be here. And the church is left wondering, why can't we evangelize? Why can't we grow? It may be because of that. And and how does God help us with this? He has a standard. He has a standard for how we live. As a matter of fact, we just read, He gives us the terminology. The fruit of the Spirit. It doesn't get any more obvious than that. It's the fruit of the Spirit you and I live by. From those they see who we belong to. That's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. God desires the highest caliber of discipleship, and each one of us is striving to be that. It takes work, it's not easy, and we're not going to get there overnight, and we're not going to be perfect. But we have one another to lock arm in arm and go to the finish line with one another and help us get there. If we are to be the highest caliber for our master, we need to also hold one another accountable lovingly. Holding each other accountable is not an act of jealousy, it's not an act of unlovingness. I don't know if that's a word, but just made it up. It's not unlovingness, if done the right way. It is love, because if we come to God and we're not prepared at the time of our death, and we're not prepared if Jesus comes again before our death happens, where are we going to be? On the wrong side. We're going to be with the rich man instead of Lazarus. Let's finally turn very quickly to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. We don't have time to read it, but Paul asks them, and he tells them, join in following my example in verse 17. But verses 18 and 19 and verses 20 and 21, they're a contrast of two different types of citizens. Verses 20 and 21, citizens of the heavenly kingdom. Verses 18 and 19, citizens of the earthly kingdom, the one leading to destruction. There's a contrast of citizenship there. One of them follows their own desires. You could say they follow their own conscience. One follows their, uh, the God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, and who set their mind on earthly things. The other one sets their citizenship and eagerly waits for the Savior. He'll transform our body. What will we be like? Don't know. All we know is we'll be transformed. See, being a Christian is not a cookie-cutter kind of life. That's not what this is. And too many people think that being a Christian is a cookie-cutter kind of life. It, no, it's not. It's a life filled with wonderful blessings. It's a life filled with a new adventure each and every single day to please our God, to walk in His ways. It's an active kind of life. It's, it is active in all the topics that are going to be discussed today. Citizenship, workmanship, discipleship, and worship. And as we continue throughout today, let us remember the importance of whose we are, the joy we have, and the fact of the matter that remains. 
You and I need to be proactive, not reactive in our city.